How many love your moments of glad grace and love your beauty with love all so true? But one man loved the pilgrim so new, and I love the sorrows of your changing face. And how are we this morning, Miss Prism? You are, I trust, well. Miss Prism has just been complaining of a slight headache. I think it would do her so much good to have a short stroll with you in the park, Dr. Chasuble. Cecily, I have not mentioned anything about a headache. No, dear Miss Prism, I know that. But I felt instinctively that you had a headache. Indeed, I was thinking about that, and not my German lesson, when the rector came in. I hope, Cecily, you are not inattentive. Oh, I'm afraid I am. That is strange. We're fortunate enough to be Miss Prism's pilgrim. Good pilgrim, I do wrong my hand too much. Which manly devotion shows in this, for saints have hands that pilgrim hands to touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. I would hang upon her lips. I spoke metaphorically. My metaphor was drawn from bees. I think, dear doctor, I will have a stroll with you. I find I have a headache after all, and a walk might do it good. With pleasure, Miss Prism. With pleasure. We might go as far as the schools and back. That would be delightful. You are my little cousin Cecily, I'm sure. You are under some strange mistake. I am not little. In fact, I believe I am more than usually tall for my age. But I am your cousin Cecily. You, I see, from your card, are Uncle Jack's brother. My cousin Ernest. My wicked cousin Ernest. <laughs> How thoughtless of me. You have come a long way. Maybe you should eat something. Won't you come in? Thank you. May I have a buttonhole first? I never have any appetite unless I have a buttonhole first. A butterscotch biscuit? No, I'd sooner have a red rose. Why? Because, oh, my love's like a red, a red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love's like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. As fair as thou, my bonny lass, so deep in love am I. Cousin Cecily. You're too much alone, dear Dr. Chasuble. You should get married. A misanthrope, I can understand. A womanthrope, never. Believe me, I do not deserve so neologistic a phrase. The precept as well as the practice of the primitive church was distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lasted up to the present day. And you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. But is a man not equally attractive when married? No married man is ever attractive except to his wife. And often, I've been told, not even to her. That depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be depended on. Ripeness can be trusted. Young women are green. I spoke horticulturally. My metaphor was drawn from fruits. Before my eyes are blind and my lips mute, I must eat core and rind of that same fruit. Before my heart is dust at the end of all, eat it I must, I must, were it bitter gall. Perhaps she followed us to the school. All her bright golden hair tarnished with rust. She that was young and fair fallen to dust. Lily like white as snow, she hardly knew. She was a woman, so sweetly she grew. I hope Cecily I shall not offend you if I state quite frankly and openly that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of the absolute perfection. I think your frankness is your great credit, Ernest, if you will allow me. I will copy your remarks into my diary. Do you really keep a diary? I'd give anything to look at it. May I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently meant for publication. When it appears in volume form, I hope you will order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it. That, sir fading, Oh, it came over my ear like the sweet sound that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odor. You can go on. I am quite ready for more. <coughs> Don't cough, Ernest. When one is dictating, one should speak fluently and not cough. Besides, I don't know how to spell cough. 
How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. If thou must love me, let it be for naught, except for love's sake only. Do not say, I love her for her smile, her look, her way of speaking gently. For a trick of thought that falls in well with mine, and certes brought a sense of pleasant ease on such a day. For these things in themselves, beloved, may be changed or changed for thee, and love so wrought may be unwrought so. Neither love me for thine own dear pity's wiping my cheeks dry. A creature might forget to weep, who bore thy comfort long, and lose thy love thereby. But love me for love's sake, that evermore thou mayst love on, through love's eternity. Cecily, I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach, when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn off from praise. I love thee with passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with the love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall love thee better after death. I don't care for anybody in the whole world but you. I love you, Cecily. Nothing in the whole world is single. All things by law divine in one spirit meet and mingle. Why not I with thine? You will marry me, won't you? You silly boy. Of course. Why, we've been engaged for the last three months. But how did we become engaged? Well, it was ever since dear Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother who was very wicked and bad. A man who is much talked about is always very attractive. I dare say it was foolish of me, but I loved you first. But afterwards your love, outsoaring mine, sang such a loftier song as drowned the friendly cooings of my dove. For verily love knows not mine or thine, with separate eye and thou free love has done. For one is both and both are one in love, which love knows not of thine that is not mine. Both have the strength and both the length thereof, both of us, of the love which makes us one. Darling, and when was the engagement actually settled? On the 14th of February last. You do not know how longingly I look upon you. You must be he I was seeking, or she I was seeking. It comes to me as of a dream. I have somewhere surely lived a life of joy with you. All is recalled as we flit by each other, fluid, affectionate, chaste, mature. You grew up with me. Were a boy with me, or a girl with me. I ate with you and slept with you. Your body has become not yours only, nor left my body mine alone. I am not to speak to you. I am to think of you when I sit alone, or awake at night alone. Worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence, I determined to end the matter one way or the other. And after a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. The next day, I bought this little ring in your name. And this is the little bangle with the true lover's knot. I promised you always to wear. For I carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. I am never without it. Anywhere I go, you go, my dear. And whatever is done by only me is your doing, my darling. But was that engagement ever broken off? Of course it was, on the 22nd of last March. Sweet rose of virtue and of gentleness, delightful lily of youthful wantonness, Riches in bounty and in beauty clear, and in every virtue that is held most dear, except only that you are merciless. Cecily, I'm very much hurt indeed to hear you broke it off. It would hardly have been a really serious engagement if it hadn't been broken off at least once, but I forgave you before the week was out. What a perfect angel you are, Cecily. You dear romantic boy. You never break off an engagement again, Cecily? I don't think I could break it off with you now that I have actually met you. Besides, of course, there is the question of your name. Yes, of course. You must not laugh at me, darling, but it had always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name was Ernest. There is something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. I pity any poor married woman whose husband is not called Ernest. But, my dear child, do you mean to say you could not love me if I had some other name? I might respect you, Ernest. I might admire your character. But I shall forget you presently, my dear. So make the most of this. 
Your little day, your little month, your little half a year, ere I forget or die or move away, and we are done forever. By and by I shall forget you, as I said, but now, if you entreat me with your loveliest lie, I will protest you with my favorite vow. After you, dear boy. Uh, no, after you. No, 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 do go first. I'm not really very good at the high bits. I'm much better low. Well, we'll see. One, two, and... The western wind is blowing fast Across the dark Aegean Sea And at the secret marble stair 